Good afternoon or good morning. Uh, welcome everyone to IO Active's Switches Get Stitches webinar. Uh, today's talk, as you can see, is presented by Colin Cassidy, who's a security consultant for IO Active. Uh, before I hand over to Colin, uh, throughout the presentation, everyone will be on mute, just so that you're aware. Um, however, following straight afterwards, we will be holding a Q&A session on Twitter, and the details of that will be at the end of this talk. Alternatively, if you do have any questions and you would prefer not to use Twitter, feel free to email us at info at ioactive.com. But for now, let me hand things over to Colin. Colin, over to you. Hello. Um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be. Um, this is Switches Get Stitches. Um, we're going to be looking at industrial control systems, uh, in particular the sort of network switches inside of them. Um, I'm Colin Casti, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, I am a senior software uh, security consultant um, at IOActive, and I have been, a, prior to that, um, 15 years uh, software developer in the industrial control system space. Um, at IOActive, uh, we're a large team of skilled uh, security professionals. We have um, engaged in a number of different research activities and a number of different testing opportunities. Um, and we have, along with that, a very um, multi-million dollar sort of hardware reversing lab that allows us to get right down to the actual chip um, hardware itself. So we can do the full spectrum from the chip right through the operating system to the applications um, and, and review and, and look at the security of all of that. So we're going to be looking at industrial control switches um, and in particular the vulnerabilities in them. Why we chose to look at these switches will hopefully become uh, clear as the, as the presentation goes on. Um, in particular, we're looking at three particular families of, of switches, um, and we will show some of the vulnerabilities in them. These aren't sort of the end of our research. We, we, we are continuing. We've got other switches that we're looking at. We're looking at other issues in these. We're looking at other vendors. So this is just sort of the start of what we found, um, and basically we're here to show that this is a, a problem that's throughout the industry. Um, this talk is interesting to you if you work with any of these switches, if you're a, you work in a utility or a factory or a plant, if you have to manage or deploy these switches, it will help give you an understanding of the security stance that these switches give you in relation to sort of the rest of your environment. Uh, if you're comfortable with the Linux command line, if you've done some web application penetration testing, you'll find that some of your skills will be transferable quite readily into, the, into this space. Some of the web stuff you've learned quite happily transfers. If you're a developer of the embedded firmware, this will give you hopefully an understanding of some of the issues that you'll probably have to face and come up with. If you're here for the vulnerabilities, we've got vulnerabilities, we'll talk about them. Um, and if you work for one of the switch manufacturers, um, don't be afraid, we don't bite. Um, we're here to help, so please do come and have a chat and we'll see what we can do for you. A quick comment before we go on. Um, there have been a no there, you will see quite a number of SCADA presentations and some of them will go like this. We own a piece of hardware, whether it be the PLC, the RTU, or, or some other piece of, of, of kit. Essentially, we steal your underpants. We then do some magic, um, and effectively, we win. Um, what we want to see, um, certainly here at iActive, and what, what we want other people to, to present is essentially more intelligent content. Um, uh, our colleague at iActive, Jason Larson, has a simple challenge to illustrate this. If you had complete control over the process of a paint factory, how would you go about attacking that process? This is purely a thought experiment. Nothing's really going to happen. But if you stole the underpants of a paint factory using this, using this analogy, what could you do? And sometimes it's hard to really think about what actually, now that I have control, what are the steps I can do to sort of influence them? And hopefully we'll go to show in this presentation some of the things that you can go wrong. So what's the point? Why are we focusing on industrial control systems? Is it any different from any other environment? Yes, it is. Um, in industrial control systems, we have to worry about the control path. We're not great. We're not so concerned about the data and, and particularly protecting the data. 
we're interested in ensuring that messages get from a control system to a piece of plant out in the field or in the factory such that something can happen. Um, or we're interested in ensuring that sensor data gets from the sensor wherever it happens to be back to the control system so that someone can see and act upon it. Um, so we're not really concerned so much about data confidentiality um, as maybe a lot of industries are, but we're, very, we're much more concerned about the integrity and availability of the data, make sure that these things happen, that um, the messages get sent through, that the messages haven't been tampered with. Um, so that's, that's why we're looking at switches. It's the switches that help ensure that those messages get through and in a sense sort of define what the process is. So where do you find these switches deployed? They will be deployed wherever they need to be in terms of the network. If you're dealing with a building management system, they're likely to be in a nice closet somewhere. If you're in the electricity or water space, you'll find that they'll be out in where the substations have to be, and that could be anywhere. It could be at the bottom of your street. It could be out in the middle of a field somewhere. These devices can be plugged in just about anywhere. So they're fairly rugged devices. Um, in the transport sector, they could be on bridges or trains or on ships, or they can be on oil rigs or gas fields. So they, these devices get dropped in just about anywhere that's needed, um, and not necessarily the most nice environment or the most accessible environment. So you want to set these devices up, put them in place, and leave them alone, essentially. You don't want people having to go out every so often and, and just keep switching or making changes to them. One of the first things we discover when we look at, in particular, SCADA protocols is there's very little sort of um, cryptographic integrity. There's a number of reasons for this. Um, essentially, the, the real key reason is the real time and safety constraints. Um, in some environments, you need to make sure that a, a signal gets from its sensor to the control system as quickly as possible. And we don't necessarily have time to package it up in a nice little um, cryptographic bundle send it over the wire and decrypt it at the other end. Um, there are timing issues that make sure that this, this stuff has to happen. Um, and in some cases, the hardware is not necessarily up to spec to be able to do that sort of maths. If it's a small sensor, it's just picking up a small bit of value, sending it down the wire as quickly as possible. So again, this shows why the switches are important. The data going through the switches is unencrypted, and there's no data integrity, which means if you can create a malicious firmware or in some way take over the switch, you can see the data, you can modify the data, you can change the data and have a potentially big impact on sort of the process that you're in and amongst. For those of you who are relatively new to the field, um, here's a list of some of the protocols. Um, by all means, take a note of one or two of them and maybe have a look at them and you'll see for quite a lot of them, there's very little sort of cryptography involved either in terms of sort of um, data integrity or data confidentiality. It's just not a thing that happens an awful lot. So that's the introduction out of the way. We can go on to the actual switches themselves. We're looking at a Siemens Scalance version 4.3 switch. We've got a Brand X switch. Um, we have the reason we've not necessarily named the manufacturer or the sort of the vendor for this one is we're not entirely sure who all the vendors are for reasons that will become clear as we progress. And we're looking at Garrett.com Family 6, uh, Family 6K. We'll go into this in terms of some vulnerabilities. We'll look at the web stuff. There'll be some light firmware reversing and some binary analysis. Um, it won't get too technical, though there may be some technical sort of screens up there. This just shows us sort of the how we do. I'll be describing what we do. So starting off with the Siemens switch, um, one of the first things we'll look at in this case will be how the authentication is managed. Um, and in this case, we can see that whenever messages are being sent back and forth through the management plane between myself or whoever it is who's connected to the switch, it sends this um, sort of concatenation of the user, the password, and this random string at the end, which it then pipes through MD5 to come up with a, a, a sort of MD5 value. The nonce, essentially this number at the end, is given to us in the previous request, so we know that. We also can guess, essentially, the login, val or login names, that's admin, 
So all we essentially have to do when we're attacking this is break the password. Um, MD5 is not particularly strong, so a password of eight characters can basically be broken in a few seconds. Um, and I think 15 characters can take a few minutes, up to about 20 minutes. And that, using this technique, allows us to essentially extract the password from the messages on the wire. Um, the nonce itself um, doesn't seem particularly cryptographically strong. It has a number of properties about it that suggest that it doesn't change all that much. When you are dealing with nonces, you want something that's uh, not predictable um, and basically changes an awful lot. In this case, we can see that the first half of the value doesn't appear to change at all, and the second half um, appears to be going up, um, which is not really what you want in sort of a session ID. Digging into it even further, the first half of it is actually the IP address, and it's not the switch's IP address, it's the device that is connected to the IP address. So if I plug in to this switch, I know immediately what the IP address is. Um, so that's half the values already it worked out. The other half is actually the uptime of the switch, so how long the switches have been powered on and running for. Um, and you can use a number of tools that will quite happily interrogate the switch and give you this value. So knowing all this, it's fairly easy to guess what the nonce values are going to be before they're even passed to you. Um, and using these, it allows us to essentially perform session hijacking attacks. Um, so if someone's logged in, we can effectively take over their session. Now, for industrial switches, or indeed switches in general, um, a session hijacking attack is not particularly exciting because you don't tend to log in to switches quite that frequently. It's something you sort of connect through to an end device. It's not often that you have to connect to a router or a switch. Um, think of the last time you had to connect to your own home router, for example. It doesn't happen all that often. So more interesting is some of the management functionality of the switch. Um, so what we discovered on the Siemens device is there's a HTTP request that you can essentially talk to directly without authenticating to the switch at all. Um, and you can ask it to download the log file. Um, and this will give you the log of what's happened on the switch with no authentication, just connect in, ask it nicely. You can ask it for its configuration, um, and this will send you, again, its configuration file, and this will include all the password hashes, allowing you to do an offline attack in your own time without being connected to it. And likewise, you can pull down the entire firmware of the switch. So just ask it, and it will give you, here is what I'm running. Through the same HTTP request, you can upload your own configuration. So one potential attack is to download the configuration, remove the password hashes it has, add to your own password hashes that you know and understand, upload that configuration, log on to the device using passwords you now know, do whatever it is you wish to do, and swap the configuration files, files back, and no one is any the wiser. Um, if you want to be even more imaginative, you can modify the firmware to do whatever you wish it to do, it be it extract values, be it modify values, and upload that firmware to the switch, and it will quite happily accept it. Um, it was fairly easy for us to get to the bottom of this, and we even wrote a nice sort of command line tool which presented a menu that allows you to do this. Um, you can download this script from my colleague's GitHub site uh, at Black Swan first. So that's the Siemens switch. Um, we reported these vulnerabilities to Siemens. Um, they patched them within about three months. Um, but what we find, particularly in this environment, because these devices either are remote or are in sort of safety critical environments that are really hard to sort of just stop, um, think nuclear reactors, you can't just power down a nuclear reactor just so you can patch a switch. It's something that has to be planned. But it can take anywhere between 12 and 18 months since the patch has been released for these switches to become sort of secure. And Therefore, it is highly likely there are switches out there with these vulnerabilities in them. So that was looking at SEMA switch. Um, you can see that that was just looking from a web application point of view. There wasn't a great deal of difficulty in, in finding these things. So the people out there who have had web applications sort of testing skills in advance, your skills will transfer. Um, and this is an environment that does need those sorts of skills. Going on to the other switch, um, this is from a particular vendor that has nine switches in this family. 
um, seven of those uh, switches are impacted by these vulnerabilities. The other two switches it has, um, one is unmanaged, um, so it doesn't have a management plane, which is what we'd be attacking, and the other one uses completely different firmware. The vendor in question also offers a 10-year warranty for all its devices, um, but we'll see that it can't necessarily sort of maintain this for these particular switches. So the first thing we find, um, again, looking at it from a purely web application point of view, the we have here is eight instances of cross-site scripting, um, one of the more sort of straightforward attacks we can we can have. Um, Looking at these links, we can see also that it runs PHP, which has had a number of security issues with it in the past. And looking at the third item in particular, we can see that it actually runs Flash. Um, again, it has had issues in the past. The eighth item on the list is quite interesting. Um, essentially, we can supply it with any URL parameter we wish. Um, this is an example of it. So this is a request we can send to the switch with essentially our, our own made up request, just asking it to perform this JavaScript, and it will quite happily take that and reflect it back to us. So there's absolutely no data validation going on whatsoever. Um, and this is what that sort of thing looks like. In this case, we're just popping up a simple alert, um, but essentially you can add your own JavaScript and get this, the switch to perform any sort of processing you wish it to do. The next thing we looked at on this switch, um, is again, much like the Siemens switch, if you go to a particular URL without authenticating at all, it will quite happily give you the configuration. Um, that's what hit miss URL does. And again, it will, it will give you the configuration. But tying that into sort of our previous attack where we could add our own parameters, we give the no cache parameter with a value. Um, again, it still works. But what happens if we made this parameter, say, 50,000 digits long, what happens to the switch? This is the sort of thing we do, is just sort of see if there's any buffers we can overflow. In this case, we had a script that did this, and after about 2,000 requests, the switch decided to reboot itself. Um, obviously, it just sort of had, it hung with the request and wasn't entirely sure how to deal with it, and some watchdog mechanism on the switch caused it to reboot. We're still investigating this. We think it might be a buffer overflow that could be exploitable that allow us to give us full control of the switch. Again, we're continuing our research, but we've not got there yet. So going back to having stolen the underpants, so we've denied, so we've caused the switch to sort of fall over. What, what sort of problems does that cause? In an industrial environment, um, there tends to be some very serious uptime requirements. If you're dealing with power stations, the power station has to keep generating electricity all the time. You can't just switch it off. It becomes very dangerous to do so. Um, so if you can perform a denial of service at the switch, it means that essentially that data is not being sent back and forth. And if the, pro if the controlling process is not receiving that data, it may decide something's gone horribly wrong and shut down to a safe environment, which in the instance of a nuclear reactor may effectively scram the nuclear reactor, despite the fact that nothing's gone wrong other than a switch is rebooting. Uh, slightly more serious in, uh, case would be um, in oil and gas manufacturing. Um, the byproduct of that is a gas called H2S, which if, re if inhaled um, can cause sort of, cause the people to be to pass out and in greater sort of quantities can kind of essentially cause death. So throughout a sort of oil rig or a gas sort of facility, they will have these sensors all about monitoring for the buildup of this gas. Um, so if you've caused the switch, which is routing all this sensor data to essentially stop and not respond anymore, the messages aren't getting through. The control system cannot send out the alert that there's a problem. It can have serious consequences for the people who are effectively working in this environment. So we'll get, do a little bit of sort of more research. Um, we we'll go a little bit deeper. Um, one of our colleagues was using one of these switches and it came aware to him that whenever he did a firmware upgrade that this occurred over FTP. And so he was interested to see what sort of security implications that were. So this colleague sent us essentially the packet capture of what's going on. Remember that this switch is essentially managed over HTTPS. So the switch management is secure. However, the firmware upgrade is sent over FTP, which is insecure, which effectively means that if we want to, we can pull out the firmware 
without too much trouble. And indeed, that's what we went and did. We analyzed the packet rate, and we could see almost immediately that there's one very large sort of stream that gives us an awful lot of information, and that's what we believed to be the firmware that was being up uploaded to the switch. So we could pull out that firmware and start investigating it. Um, when we're doing sort of firmware analysis, we start off using sort of two of our favorite tools. The first one is a is an executable called file. And what this does is this analyzes sort of the large whatever file it happens to be and gives us an idea of what it is. It could come back and say it's a JPEG, it could come back and say it's an MP3, it could come back and say it's an executable. In this case, it just told us it's data. Not particularly exciting. The other tool we tend to use is an application called Binwalk. And this is a sort of more in-depth version of file. It analyzes the whole executable and, and determines if there's sort of bits and pieces in it that it kind of identify. So in the binary, uh, is there a section that is a JPEG? Is there a section that is an MP3? Is there a section that is um, executable? Is there a section that's HTML? Um, and it will tell you all the bits that this binary is made up of. And in this case, Bin Walker told us nothing at all. So our two favorite tools told us nothing. So we're a bit of a loss. So we'll fall back to old school and we'll run strings, which is a very simple tool that says pull out all the sort of text strings in this binary. After finding a lot of bit of rubbish, um, we found two entries which gave us a bit of clue to what's going on. There was uh, deflate and inflate. So essentially, we're dealing with a compressed file, which explains why we couldn't find them, I think. So attempting to deflate the whole thing fails. Um, it just doesn't quite work. There's some sort of magic that occurs on the switch end that we hadn't worked out at the time. So we wrote a small script that essentially went through each and every byte in the binary and so to work out which section could be decompressed. And it produces us some nice numbers. And it gives us a section of the file that, we can, be, that can be decompressed. We then use a nice tool called DD to pull out the compressed bit um, from the rest of the binary. And then we can pipe that with a few bits and pieces of magic through gzip. And that gives us a decompressed binary that we can then properly analyze. Things like bin walk and things like file now give us something sensible. And we can plug it into our other favorite reverse engineering tools. So we've got our decompressed binary. How do we start looking for vulnerabilities? Well, what sort of vulnerabilities would a firmware have? Um, in this case, we would think about, well, does it have hard-coded credentials? Are there sort of private keys in there? So the xxd command is a nice little sort of search that will go through the entire binary and search for RSA private keys. Um, and with this firmware, we successfully found two private keys, um, the details of which are here. That's great. We now have two private keys from this switch. What can we do with them? Um, the first key, well, what we can do with that is we can plug that into Wireshark, which is a tool for capturing sort of data as it flows along the line. And this allows us to now decrypt all the sort of HTTP management messages which were originally sent securely. So having grabbed the firmware off the wire via a FTP command, um, we can now sort of go back in time and read all the messages that were sent to the switch when it was being managed before. Um, and this is what some of those messages look like. Um, in this case, we can see that the message being sent was a login and password with the login of manager and the password of manager. So it allows us to determine, having captured some previously encrypted data, we can decrypt it and see what was going on at the time. So what about the second key? The second key is a private RSA key. Um, it requires a password. We didn't feel like brute forcing it, although we could do, but we might still be at it even now. Um, we tried the obvious thing of using all the strings in the image, just in case one of them happens to be the password. That didn't quite work. So now we've got to do a bit more sort of in-depth reverse engineering. So we use everyone's favorite tool. In this case, it's either Pro, uh, after some experimentation and, and looking around, we determined that this that this RSA key is essentially used for the SSH trans, uh, SSH communication between a 
laptop and the switch to manage it over SSH. However, um, we were unable to enable SSH. The device in question required a password that we didn't have. It would require us to essentially go back to the vendor and ask them for a password. So it's not ideal that we have to ask the vendor for the SSH enablement password. It should just have been enabled, one would have imagined. So what can we do next? Can we patch in our own key? Rather than relying on the key that we don't have a password for, can we generate our own key with a known password? Um, and then sort of package it back up into the firmware and upload that to this to the switch. The questions we then have to face is will there be sort of CRC checks, will there be firmware signing, will there be sort of checks to make sure the firmware hasn't been sort of tampered with in any way. And in the first instance we did that um, and yes there's clearly some sort of validation that goes on. Uh, it tells us that in this case it was not a valid image. We did some more digging and we got it to at least say something else that appeared to be a valid image, but now the binary appears to be corrupt. Um, unfortunately, this is where we have to leave the story. This is about as far as we've got with this switch um, doing these attacks at the minute. Um, but we are ongoing. We're still trying to get around these particular issues. However, um, it's not quite as simple as that. The vendor for our switch, um, being one particular company, the actual manufacturer of the switch is Garrettcom. So while we've informed the vendors that these, these issues are present, they also affect Garrettcom switches. Um, and this is where part of the problem lies. Garrettcom manufacture these switches, and there are probably a number of vendors that sell these. So whilst we can report that vendor A has a vulnerability in these switches, we don't necessarily know that vendor B doesn't have these vulnerabilities either. And you may see um, security reports out there saying, Vendor A switches are vulnerable to cross-site scripting. And if you're sitting there with vendor B switches, how do you know you're not impacted as well? Um, but what we do know is that these issues we found in the, this switch also affect the Garrettcom switches. So that the eight cross-site scriptings, that's the one denial of service, that's one harder coded key. And it leads us back to the problem we discussed earlier. The original vendor of the brand X switch said it's got a 10-year warranty. Now, Garrettcom are not necessarily held by that same warranty. Um, it's well within their rights to say, nope, sorry, we've end of life that switch. Um, we're not supporting it anymore. There's not much we can do about it. And that leaves the original vendor in sort of a sticky situation as they've promised to sort of support this. Um, so it's these sorts of problems that we also have to deal with. It's not just finding the vulnerabilities. It's managing who do we have to report these issues to and who is responsible for getting them fixed and are they necessarily going to get them fixed. It becomes a bit of a web very, very quickly. So having done all that, we've also managed to identify Garrettcom's private key um, in their switches and that here too. So having gone through sort of how we own these switches, let's go back to the original sort of problem we had before. Um, now that we can own a switch, what can we do? Um, we have stolen the underpants of the switch. What ultimately can we do with that? Well, we've seen we can alter the switch's configuration. That might allow us to ex exfiltrate the process data. So whilst there's not a great deal of confidentiality in the environment, there may still be sort of proprietary information that you want to keep. Maybe there's some aspect of the process that is um, particularly sort of intrinsically you want secured. Um, this would be one way to extract that. We can perform a denial of service attack. This can disrupt the process, and de depending on the environment you're in, this can have catastrophic effects. Um, so basically, we man in the middle the entire process. We can disrupt the process. We can alter values, make it believe one thing whilst doing something else. We can drop process traffic. We do have this real-time constraints to see, deal with. Um, these are real-time systems, so you can't necessarily take over a switch, have it exfiltrate the data all the way to your laptop somewhere, uh, modify the data and send it all back in. It does have to be managed on the switch, which is why sort of compromising the, the switch and managing to take over its firmware is important. It allows you to do it all on the switch itself. So summarizing, um, having got your nice control system up and running, you understand the security stance of it. Um, there's just this small issue of how do we deal with the switches. Um, 
whereas before they're normally seen as a means to an end. If you're going to connect to something, you usually connect through the switch. You don't tend to think about looking at the switch as something you can look at and attack itself. So having understood your security stance before, we now have this problem of, oh, now we have to deal with the switches. And you've got issues like these session IDs not necessarily being brilliant, um, the fact that we can brute force them fairly easily, um, the fact that we can perform firmware uploads and downloads without any authentication, reflected cross-site scripting, denial of service without authentication, the fact that we can pull out the hard-coded uh, RSA keys and then for read all the data that goes back and forth over the switches from now until the end of time and indeed everyone else's switches who had exactly the same problem. So a number of these and we have the conflicts between, well, vendor A sells it but it's a different manufacturer and the manufacturer may end of life the device. So it leads to a number of problems. That's as much as we've got at the minute, um, we are continuing this investigation. We're continuing looking at this. Um, there will be sort of more research into this that we'll be presenting on. Will we finally get arbitrary firmware? That's something we're working on. We are certainly looking at new switches and new vendors, and there are many other people involved in this research who are looking at all this stuff, and maybe they will be presenting next time. So thank you all for listening. Um, Please join us on Twitter for the next 30 minutes or so. Ask us questions using the hashtag hash askioactive or email us at info at ioactive.com.